Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ken Irvin. I'm the Education Coordinator at Guelph Museums. Today I'd like to tell you about bringing light to Guelph. Well, the first 40 years of Guelph's history were the dark ages for our city. The only way to bring light into your home was through candles, kerosene lamps, or fireplaces. People rose with the sun and they retired when the sun set. Homes and businesses had plenty of windows as daylight was cheaper than candles. And this meant shorter working hours in the winter and longer working hours in the summer. And for many families, the kitchen was actually the gathering place as it had light and warmth from the fireplace to draw the family together. Well, to, to maintain a 12 hour workday, businesses actually had to find a way to bring enough light into their workplace. So just behind me is where the McRae woolen mills were, uh, at the corner of uh, Surrey and what was known as Huskisson then, but it's now Wyndham Street. At the McRae woolen mills, you might notice that there's a huge number of windows in the front, and there's actually a gas lamp on the street just in front of the building. And you might also notice that there are no trees near the building uh, that would block out the sunlight. During Guelph's first 40 years, when the sun went down, our streets were dark. There was one section of McDonnell Street that uh, really kind of illustrated this problem. There was a stump of the very first tree cut down by John Galt and his party, and it was being preserved with a small fence around it. Uh, but it sat actually right in the middle of McDonnell Street, at the very bottom of the hill near the river. Well, some patrons of our downtown taverns often forgot about this historic stump in the middle of the street. Uh, and then driving home after dark, they forgot about the stump and frequently crashed into it. Well, the city leaders knew that they had to do something to rectify this situation. So the stump was pulled up and a plaque describing the founding of the city site was placed uh, on the train bridge. Guelph's town council was very eager to find some way to bring light and potential prosperity to the city. In the 1860s, 25 kerosene street, la street lamps were erected at a cost of $5.75 each. This was to bring some light to the downtown. But to save money, they were only lit when the moon was not out. Uh, the town hall caretaker, uh, Mr. William Edridge, was given the job of lighting the street lamps. With his ladder and a small two-wheeled cart, he was out every evening to light the lamps, and then again every morning to put the lights out then fill them with kerosene, trim the wicks, and clean the glass. And here you can see uh, St. George's Square with the street lamps uh, around the fountain. The Guelph Herald reported that the lights fulfilled their purpose as efficiently as their small number could have anticipated. They gave a brilliant light to the immediate vicinity. The Mercury said, there are too few lights for so many streets, but half a loaf is better than no bread. Less than 10 years later, in 1870, the Guelph Gas Company was formed. Charging the city $16,000, they purchased a lot, constructed a building, laid pipes, and purchased equipment to provide gas lighting for 100 customers. On January 31st, the city celebrated as City Hall was lit with gas for the very first time. By 1874, just four years later, there was enough of an increase in demand that the gas company built a larger building, a holding tank, and more gas lines and mains were laid in the downtown area. So where did the gas come from? Well, it's actually produced right here right where the parking lot is in front of the Guelph Police Station on Fountain Street. And here you can see an aerial view of this area with the large black gas tanks are seen in the bottom corner. Prior to the use of natural gas, virtually all gas for fuel and lighting was manufactured from coal. This was discovered by a, a Flemish scientist named Jan Baptista van Helmen. And it, it was around uh, 1609 when he discovered this. And he used the name gas to describe his discovery as of a wild spirit which escaped from heated wood and coal. The gas was origi originally created uh, as a byproduct of the coking process uh, developed during the 19th century. Facilities where the gas was produced were often known as manufactured gas plants or gas works. As we know, lighting with gas did not last. There was a cleaner, safer and cheaper way to bring light to the city. The first time people of Guelph actually witnessed electric lighting was during the Provincial Fair in 1883 at the Fair Building in Exhibition Park. By 1887, City Hall was petitioned by the townspeople to replace the gas lamps with the new Dynamo Arc electric lamps. And you can see some of them here uh, in St. George's Square um, around the blacksmith's fountain. They're at the top of the poles. So it's kind of hard to see them, but they are there. The Guelph Gas Company built a small water power generating station at Spence's Mill, which was also known as Allen's Mill. Uh, the city was charged 40 cents per light per night. Four years later, the electric system was converted to a coal-generated high-tension alternating current, 
and all the city gas lamps were replaced by electric lamps. You can see in this picture uh, the dining room at the American Hotel in Guelph in 1910, and here's one of the gas lights that they would have used to light up and uh, bring light to hotel rooms and uh, restaurants and taverns downtown. By 1900, the company was known as the Guelph Electric Light and Power Company. The name change did not improve the customer's growing frustration with the, with the company's operations. Prices were high and the quality was pretty poor. The public actually pushed for the city to take over the operations. The, cow, the power company was making a really healthy profit as they actually increased their prices because they thought the price of coal was going to go up. Well, the price of coal didn't go up, but they kept the increase in their price. Here you're going to see a picture of the MF Cray Coal and Wood Company. And this is actually right where it's located. Where I'm standing is right where that picture was taken. And you can see in the very back of the picture, a big black tank, which is where the coal gas was produced. And so there was a woolen mill just down here. And right here on this corner was where uh, the, the coal and wood supplier was. So people were heating their homes with coal and wood. But also at this time, uh, the hydroelectric power was coming online. It was soon to be made available with Niagara power operations being built. Uh, Guelph City Council really pushed to acquire uh, the, the Guelph Light and Power Company and many council members were in favor of this. And in 1903, the company was taken over by the city at a cost of $155,000. Uh, this was kind of an inflated purchase price uh, as the company was making a really good profit and the city hoped that that profit would stay and increase actually so they thought if they paid a high price for it they would make out, make out in the end. The city now running the electrical company they looked for ways to provide cheaper electricity while charging the same rate. The Niagara hydroelectric power looked to be the answer for this problem. Uh, the steam generated electricity that the city was producing in 1903 cost $40 per horsepower, while hydroelectricity could be obtained for about $15 per horsepower. A year earlier, in 1902, Guelph was actually represented at a large meeting in Berlin, which is now called Kitchener, uh, concerning the founding of a public power uh, company in Ontario. Several companies, city council members, numerous business leaders, uh, like Guelph's alderman J.W. Uh, Lyon, and Sir Adam Beck really pushed for the passing of a bill to establish Ontario Power Commission. Uh, this would give municipalities access to electricity transmitted from Niagara. J.W. Lyon was a huge supporter of uh, hydropower and actually became secretary of the Power Commission. By April, the Ontario Hydroelectric Power Commission was formed. It was chaired by Adam Beck, who having attended school at the Rockwood Academy, was supportive of Guelph and other smaller communities growing energy needs. Work on power transmission lines from Niagara throughout southern Ontario started in 1908. And by October of 1910, hydroelectricity from Niagara was ready to be transmitted. There were numerous switched on ceremonies uh, held throughout the province. The city started receiving hydroelectric power from Niagara. Berlin, or Kitchener, claimed to be the first to receive Niagara power. But according to former general manager of Guelph Hydro, Gord Stacy, the power was turned on in Guelph the day before Kitchener as Kitchener's power lines actually came through Guelph. So once Niagara Power was coming steadily to the Edinburgh Road power plant, the city steam plant then was closed. Not only can Guelph unofficially claim to be the first city in the province to receive hydroelectric power from Niagara, we were the first municipality to pay off our debt to the hydroelectric uh, system. The total amount we paid off for receiving this power uh, was $1,185,501. Lighting in Guelph has come a long way. Today, Electra, Electra Utilities, formerly uh, Guelph Hydroelectric Systems Incorporated, delivers a safe and reliable supply of electricity to approximately 53,000 residential, commercial, and industrial customers in Guelph and Rockwood. These days, we take for granted uh, the electricity that powers our homes and businesses. We should really thank our civic leaders from 120 years ago who brought Guelph and the province to the forefront of this new technology and really into the light.